Hi everybody. This is the problem of the USSR and the possibility of a third historical solution. This was originally published in February 1947 and it's by Cornelius Castoriadis. Some elementary notions concerning revolutionary theory. One, the most striking manifestation of the crisis of the Fourth International is to be found in its theoretical stagnation. Since the death of Trotsky, not only have we searched in vain for a trace of one new idea in all the Fourth's publications, but also the level of theoretical and political discussions has suffered a tremendous decline and atmosphere of suspicion surrounds every attempt at renewal. Two. The historical cause of this sterility is to be found in the impossibility of making any theoretical advance during a period of momentous defeats for the revolutionary movement. As is the case with the period through which we just have passed. The influence of this objective factor has been reinforced by the ecclesiastical and scholastic attitude vis-a-vis -vis revolutionary theory that characterizes the ruling apparatus of the international. 3. Revolutionary theory is not a dogma revealed once and for all, but rather an integral part of revolutionary action, constantly evolving in the same manner as the latter. Proletarian revolutions are not uniform applications of invariant principles and of a, quote, tradition, or, and of, quote, tradition, end quote, but, rather, proletarian revolutions, quote, criticize themselves constantly, come back to the apparently accomplished in order to begin it afresh, deride with unmerciful thoroughness the inadequacies, deride with unmerciful, unmerciful thoroughness the inadequacies, weaknesses, and paltrinesses of their first attempts, end quote. Marx, the 18th Brumaire. Likewise, revolutionary theory is continually obliged to put itself into question, to reassert itself in light of every new scientific discovery and through the assimilation of new historical experiences. To each stage of the revolutionary movement, there corresponds a more or less profound theoretical upheaval. Four. The same conclusion follows from the theory of permanent revolution, according to which, quote, all social relations are transformed for an indefinite period of time in the course of continual internal struggle, end quote. Quote, revolutions in economy, in technique, in science, develop in a complex reciprocal action, develop in complex reciprocal action, and do not allow society to achieve equilibrium, end quote. To the permanent revolution in transitional society, there corresponds the permanent revolution in revolutionary theory. 5. Moreover, revolutionary theory remains a mere ideology until communism is achieved. Consequently, some parts of this theory are revealed sooner or later to become more or less ideological, i.e. false. Other parts adequate at first become increasingly abstract until a new examination brings them back in touch with reality. 6. This new examination is indispensable today when it comes to the problem of the USSR, of the degeneration of a proletarian revolution, and of the inevitability of socialism. From the theoretical point of view, let us note that, except in passing, neither Marx nor Lenin had envisaged the case of a revolution degenerating. Trotsky, while he examined his, this case, refused till the end to relate this problem to that of barbarism, though he deemed it necessary to bring the latter phenomenon to the proletariat's attention. From the political point of view, we urgently need to take a stand against the international's present line, which with its, quote, unconditional defense of the USSR, end quote, and the theory of the, quote, socialist basis of the Soviet economy, end quote, does everything it can to polarize the masses toward the Russian side and constitutes, in fact, a, quote, leftist, end quote, 
cover for Stalinism. 7. For us to re-examine the problem of the inevitability of socialism and to speak of a, quote, third solution, end quote, does not mean to challenge the revolutionary stance, as is the case with ignorant confusionists of the D. MacDonald sort, or to bow to the inevitable along with the conformism of LeBlanc, but to render the revolutionary perspective more complete and to seek the means to struggle against the new dangers that menace it. <laughs> Inevitability of socialism and the possibility of a third historical solution. 8. As with Marx's and Lenin's similar formulations, the dilemma posed by Trotsky, socialism or barbarism, explicitly recognizes that socialism is neither fated nor inevitable, that it is simply possible. 9. This fact entails two conclusions relative to the nature of the historical process. First, the historical process is neither fated nor necessarily determined in advance. Even if the evolution of nature and of history were set in advance like clockwork, our knowledge of this evolution and consequently every prov provision could only be relative. But reality is not a clockwork mechanism. Causal laws, which seem to us to rule reality, constitute merely a first approximation. And scientific investigations have demonstrated that at a deeper level, reality is regulated only by statistical laws of probability. History is determined in a definitive manner only by the determinate action of man. Just as the philosophical problem of free will and of the individual, excuse me, just as the philosophical problem of free will on the individual level is merely a pseudo problem, for it is only through his action alone that man can show at any time to what extent he is free, i.e. determined by an authentic consciousness. So, also on the historical level, does the conscious action of humanity and of the revolutionary class determine, within the limits of possibility, the direction of history? Second, the historical process does not follow a straight and narrow line of ascent. As Trotsky said, quote, history often passes by blind alleys like Stalin, end quote. More generally, history, along with its periods of progress, also experiences its periods of breakdown and collapse, periods of barbarism as occurred, for example, during the period following the fall of the Roman Empire from the 4th to the 10th century. It is not through a priori reasoning that the extent and depth of such periods can be determined, but rather through the study of facts and above all through revolutionary action itself. The only thing that can be determined in advance are possibilities. Today, the possibility of socialism as opposed to the possibility of a period of definite historical collapse, such as barbarism. The Classical Schema for the End of Capitalism, from Marx to Trotsky. Ten. What that capitalism, like every social system, is constantly wearing itself down and is approaching its own violent collapse is a truth that hardly needs to be demonstrated. Marx's essential contribution was to elucidate and to put forward these two additional ideas, namely a. that the proletariat constitutes the fundamental lever for the overthrow of capitalism, and b. that the result of the conquest of power by the proletariat will be the instant duration of socialism. It is indispensable to follow the fortunes of these two fundamental Marxist positions in the three periods through which they have passed to date. The period of classical Marxism, that of Leninism, and one through which we have been passing ever since the conclusion of the process of degeneration of the Third International. 11. In classical Marxism, the idea that the overthrow of capitalism will be the work of the proletariat is founded upon the conception that in the last analysis there are in capitalist society only two sources of historical power, the bourgeoisie and the proletariat. 
many social strata can enter into conflict with capitalism, but only the proletariat is willing and able to lead this conflict up to the point of social revolution. This fact is based not upon a proletarian messian messianism, messianism, but upon an analysis of the working class's economic, political, and social condition, which we cannot dwell upon here. We therefore can sketch Marx's schema for the end of capitalism in the following manner. Deeper and deeper crises of capitalist society, middle class disintegration, heightened proletarian consciousness. In the most advanced societies that will bring the rest of the world into this evolutionary schema. For Marx, the socialist revolution is a product of the overdevelopment of capitalist society. 12. In the Leninist period, however, new factors arise. On the one hand, this overdevelopment of capitalism entails a diminution of revolutionary potential in the most advanced nations, corruption of the labor aristocracy, and of the trade union and political bureaucracy, imperialistic pay bonuses granted to a part of the proletariat in the imperialist countries. Consequently, the, quote, backward, end quote, countries take on a particular importance for the revolutionary struggle. But if the center of gravity is displaced towards the backward countries, if the weakest link is to be found most often in the countries where capitalist development is the weakest, a significant part of the classical schema is overturned, and it, and it may be asked how the weak proletariat of a backward country can achieve victory. How could this victory on such a technically, economically, and culturally low level inaugurate the realization of socialism? The theory of permanent revolution provides the answer. As a matter of fact, even in a backward country, only the proletariat would be able to resolve for good the country's social problems, even those of national liberation and democratic transformation. On the other hand, if the revolution begins in a backward country, it will culminate in victory by extending itself into the rest of the world, by bringing in its wake the advanced countries that alone can resolve the problem for good. In this way, the two classical propositions are rescued. 13. This rescue, however, is only apparent. As a matter of fact, the permanence of the revolution is not a law that obtains at all times and in a positive direction. It is a condition, a simple hypothesis. The theory of permanent revolution neither affirms nor could it affirm that, quote, in every revolution occurring in a backward country, the proletariat will take power and will set up its dictatorship. Every revolution begun on the national level will extend itself on to the international level and will bring in its wake the advanced countries, end quote. It says simply that, quote, only if the proletariat takes over the direction of the revolution will the revolution be able to reach a culmination. Only if the revolution extends itself into the international level, onto the international level, will the revolution be able to bring the world victory of socialism in its wake, end quote. I'm going to assume that's Trotsky, since this is... Uh, this was published for a discussion within the Fourth International or something like that. So, I'm, And there's no footnotes here to tell me otherwise, but I'm going to assume, since we're talking about the theory of permanent revolution, that those quotes are Trotsky's. Far from settling this question, the revolution once begun can only pose it. But what if the proletariat does not assume the direction of the revolution? China. What if the revolution is not extended to the rest of the world? Russia. For Trotsky, the answer is simple. In this case, there will be a victory for the counter-revolution that itself also is permanent. The revolution will be crushed for a definite period of time, and the counter-revolution will triumph worldwide, bringing things back, so to speak, to their point of departure. At this point, two factors intervened that Trotsky obstinately ignored. The first was that this process could not go on indefinitely. Defeats of the proletariat have profound results that put a mortgage on the future, and their accumulation signifies more than simple arithmetic addition. The second was that in the case of an isolated revolutionary victory, the crushing of the movement in the rest of the world did not entail the immediate restoration of capitalism in this country. A period of time elapses 
but during which the revolu this revolution degenerates almost by fate. Trotsky established the fact of this degeneration, but following the schema of permanent revolution, Trotsky stubbornly repeated that this degeneration was an episodic and passing phenomenon, a contradiction that ultimately would be resolved either by the restoration of capitalism or by the worldwide victory of socialism. We are obliged today to state that degeneration itself also is permanent. In the country where it becomes installed, degeneration develops into a new and consummate form of class society, and from there it influences the rest of the working class movement, enslaves this movement, employs this movement in order to maintain itself against capitalism, and tries to encroach upon the rest of the world. Before examining the fate of the two classical propositions in the present era, it is incumbent upon us, therefore, to analyze more thoroughly the problem of degeneration. The Degeneration of the Proletarian Revolution in General 14. Was the degeneration of the dictatorship of the proletariat in Russia, and will it remain in history a specifically, quote, Russian, end quote, phenomenon, or a phenomenon peculiar to backward or isolated countries? Or is it the general fortune of every revolution? To avoid meeting up again with the theory of, quote, socialism in one country, on the opposite side, we should recognize that we are dealing here not with Russia's miraculous and peculiar properties, but with more deep-seated factors in the evolution of history that begat Stalinism in the evolution of history that begat Stalinism. Just as the Russian Revolution expressed not only the state of Russian society, but principally the contradictions of world capitalism, likewise its degeneration is not an accidental outcome, but instead reveals highly significant tendencies in our overall historical situation. Indeed, Trotsky, no less than Stalin, marveled at the Russian phenomenon. Despite all his analysis, analyses, it remained for him isolated, episodic, monstrous, having no organic relation to the state of the world economy or to the essential characteristics of the proletarian movement. Having from the first put his finger on the two fundamental factors of Russian degeneration, the ebbing of the world revolution and the backward state of the Russian economy, he refused till the end of his life to examine the extent to which these two factors were general and capable of appearing in every revolution. It is clear, however, that the isolation of a victorious revolution is not, quote, fortuitous, end quote, in the historical sense of the word, and that it can happen again in the future. The all-round development of capitalism will never signify that the world will become completely standardized, and especially not with respect to the political consciousness of the proletariat. The revolution's process of maturation t takes place at different pace paces, at different paces, P-A-C-E-S, in different countries. All our efforts are aimed towards synchronizing the international revolution, but their success is never guaranteed in advance. In contrast to the bourgeois revolution, whose permanence on an international level is founded above all on the automatic functioning of industrial expansion, no automatic economic mechanism guarantees the rapid expansion of the proletarian revolution. But why is an isolated revolution fatally doomed to degenerate when it is not defeated immediately? First of all, for political reasons, the victorious proletariat, as it becomes aware of how the revolution is being crushed in other countries, and of its own isolation, becomes demoralized and abandons the state to the bureaucracy. But where does this bureaucracy come from? From the, quote, backward state of the country, end quote? From the economic scarcity that makes one need a, quote, guardian of inequality, end quote? a role, quote, the masses cannot and do not want to play, end quote. But what if the country is not backward? Every country is, quote, economically backward, end quote, or rather economically inadequate to the task when it is isolated from the world economy. But what if the revolution is vanquished on the world level? Here, too, there is no economic or other type of automatic mechanism that necessarily excludes the possibility of degeneration. Only the phase of of higher communism constitutes such a guarantee. Until then, the economy will furnish necessary, but by no means sufficient bases for the building of socialism. The rest depends upon the proletariat's political maturity and vigilance. 
Indeed, up until the phase of higher communism, society continues to pass through a period of economic scarcity. Socialism itself is a regime ruled by goods shortages, and it continues to be a regime of inequality. For a period of time, consequently, the, quote, war of all against all, end quote, over the hoarding of products that exist in limited quantities will continue, and people centered around the political and economic ruling circles will inevitably ha try to lay hold of this power for themselves in order to guarantee privileges for themselves. Once these people are installed in power, the inevitable cycle of degeneration begins. Revolutionary Marxism has nothing to do with fatalism. Present-day technique renders socialism possible, but not at all inevitable. The achievement of socialism depends upon the proletariat's conscious revolutionary action, even and especially after the seizure of power. Things then become much more difficult. Fluctuations in proletarian consciousness and internal differentiation within this class are not automatically abolished by the seizure of power. Degeneration can always be grafted onto these difficulties. Marx was mistaken about many things, but Marx brilliantly foresaw the general direction of historical development. The abolition of capitalism's social forms and worldwide economic and political concentration. This outcome is determined today most fatally by the development of technique. Whether this process of concentration will operate upon a bureaucratic basis or upon a proletarian basis, however, cannot be settled by a process of reasoning. It will be settled by the action of the proletariat, to the revolutionary consciousness of the proletariat, to its power of mass action. There corresponds the socialist solution. To a prolonged drop in its level of consciousness, to the problems involved in its becoming concentrated, to its breakdown as brought about by the agony of imperialism and the degeneration of the state, and of the, quote, working class, end quote, parties, there corresponds the bureaucratic solution. Both solutions are contained organically in the ambiguity of the social situation of capitalism in capitalism's death throes, which signifies, on the one hand, a liberation of progressive forces and on the other hand, a profound breakdown of society. Two new factors in the present period. Fifteen. We can mention here only very briefly the appearance of new factors that make the prospects for bureaucratization grow even more likely. The first factor involves the spread of this degeneration from the USSR toward the capitalist countries through Stalinist parties. The political and trade union bureaucracy of these parties, unlike that of social democracy, does not join up organically with capitalism, but rather prepares to bring its respective countries into the Soviet zone. And if this is impossible at the present time, it prepares to take the most advantageous positions in the capitalist state with an eye toward the next conflict between the USSR and the United States. Because of the military-like form of organization of these parties, the masses who follow this leadership are much more difficult to lead toward genuine revolutionary action. The second factor involves Europe's devastation by the war. In a number of countries, the war set off an unprecedented social crisis. The bankruptcy of the revolutionary movement during this period and the character of the particular conjunctural situation made the exploited masses of these countries easy prey for Stalinist demagogy. The result was that the Stalinist parties almost came to power in all these countries, and now, in accordance with their own tactics and with a tempo derived from these tactics, they subject them to a process of structural assimilation with Russia, i.e., to a process of bureaucratization. Like the Soviet bureaucracy itself, the new class that is, the process, that is in the process here of coming into being did not have to be contained and advanced in the economic structure of capitalist society, for its appearance corresponds not to a phase of progress, but rather to a phase of historical collapse and social breakdown. 16. To sum up, a third historical solution beyond the dilemma of capitalism or socialism is possible. It corresponds to the proletariat's potential revolutionary bankruptcy, and its historical meaning would be that of a fall into an unprecedented modern barbarism entailing an unbridled, rationalized exploitation of the masses, their complete political dispossession, and the collapse of culture. The socialist solution remains today the only progressive solution. To choose between bureaucratic barbarism 
and ultra-imperialist barbarism are no, has no meaning for us. Neither before the question is settled, for until then we are struggling for the socialist revolution, nor afterwards, since we will then try anew to organize the struggle of the exploited against the new regime on the basis of a revolutionary program. The Bureaucratic Society Juridical Forms and Economic Realities 17. Every discussion of the Russian question has been obscured by the confusion unpardonable for Marxists between the real relations of production in Russia and the juridical formulas employed by the bureaucracy to camouflage these relations. Maintaining this confusion within the proletariat by means of the theory of the, quote, socialist basis, excuse me, quote, socialist basis of the Soviet economy, end quote. The Fourth International is indulging in the same kind of mendacious and hypocritical apologetics that bourgeois professors employ when they talk about the sovereignty of the people and civil equality as guaranteed by the Constitution. 18. The relations of production that determine the structure of a society are the social relations of exchange, the real daily relations of man with man and of class with class, real property relations or the relations of possession, people's relations with the material objects that enter into their economic activity are purely and simply a function and result of the relations of production. As for the juridical expression of these relations, i.e. the formal system of property ownership in a juridical sense, its role is not to disrupt the economy's functioning, but rather to mask in the best fashion possible its class content. Originally, the sole function of law was to reflect economic relations. The more culture develops and the more the masses enter into daily political life, the more the principal function of law becomes not to reflect but to camouflage economic realities as effectively possible. See Engel's letter to Schmidt. October 27, 1890. The Bureaucratic Economy, 19. The economic process in Russia takes place basically between two social categories, the proletariat made up of all unskilled workers and having at its disposal only its labor power, and the bureaucracy which includes the people who do not participate in material production who alone assume the management and control of the work of others. Between these two categories is inserted a more or less privileged laboring and intellectual aristocracy. What defines the two fundamental categories qua classes is their absolutely different role in relation to production. 20. The class character of the productive process in Russia is guaranteed by a. The bureaucracy's actual possession of the productive apparatus, with which the bureaucracy has totally at its disposal, and by the proletariat's total dispossession therefrom. b. The monopoly of the bureaucracy excuse me, the monopoly of the bureaucracy exercises over the management of production, and c the objectives the bureaucracy imposes upon production and which are designed to serve bureaucratic interests. Production plans are only the numerical expression of bureaucratic interests. twenty one. Neither production plans nor the, quote, nationalization, end quote, of the means of production by themselves have anything to do with the collectivization of the economy. To collectivize the economy means to give the actual possession, the management, and the enjoyment of the fruits of the economy, each being inseparable from the others, to the collectivity of workers. On the other hand, this is possible only if the latter really exercise political power, not none of these conditions are excuse me none of these conditions are fulfilled in russia 22 the same class character in russia determines the distribution of social revenues among the various social categories whereas for the pro proletariat whereas for the proletarian the only sources of income are the proceeds from the sale of his labor power wages the bureaucrat enjoys a surplus income unrelated to his productive contribution and proportional to his place in the bureaucratic pyramid. This surplus income comes from the exploitation of the proletariat. In capitalist society, exploitation was, excuse me, exploitation has objective limits. 
which are expressed by laws regulating the rate of surplus value and the objective value of labor power. In Russia, the sole limit on exploitation is the corporeal resistance of the worker. For the rate of surplus value, the percentage of exploitation is, quote, freely, end quote, determined by the bureaucracy, and the law of value loses its meaning as the conditions for its application do not exist there. 23. Indeed, the law of value implies individual property, competition, and an absolutely free market. All these conditions are absent in Russia. This is why, within given physical and technical boundaries, the interest of the bureaucracy replaced the automatic functioning of economic laws as the factor determining the orientation of the economy. 24. Whereas the class character of this economy is manifest, the system of actual property ownership that forms its basis can be compared to no other historically extant system of rule. Bureaucratic property is neither individual nor collective. Bureaucratic property is a form of private property since bureaucratic property exists only for the bureaucracy and the rest of society is completely dispossessed therefrom. But it is a private form of property exploited in common by a class and a collective form of property within this class, whereas in other respects internal differentiation still exists. Whereas in other respects internal differentiations still exist. In this sense, it can be defined in summary terms as a form of collective private property, the bureaucratic state. 25. The bureaucracy's class position rests upon its guarantee, excuse me, the bureaucracy's class position rests upon and is guaranteed by its exclusive possession of the state apparatus. In the bureaucratic state, we witness the point of culmination of the phenomenon that already is characteristic of imperialism the merger, even on the personal level, of economic strength and state power. In light of the nature of bureaucratic society, the classic definition of the state has to be supplemented. The state today is the monopoly over material violence plus the monopoly over ideas. The Collapse of Culture So-called Russian culture today is an appalling example of ignorance, self-complacency, oversimplification, brutishness, brutishness, and, quote, Asiatic, end quote, dogmatism. As such, it can be compared to no other epoch of human civilization, and it constitutes, in fact, the negation of culture. The revival in the bureaucracy's ideological fabrications, excuse me, the revival in the bureaucracy's, quote, ideological, end quote, fabrications of well-known reactionary themes, fatherland, family, religion, etc., does not signify a trend toward the return of capitalism, but derives simply from the stabilization of a class that, in order to justify its domination, gives itself a, quote, ideology, end quote, by grabbing it up wherever it can. The Social and Historical Character of the Bureaucracy 28. The class character of bureaucracy follows from the specific role it plays in the economy. In production, the bureaucrat carries out a role that is the absolute negation of the proletarians. Qua members of the dominant class, he possesses the productive apparatus from which the proletarian is alienated. If given the opportunity, the bureaucracy will fulfill, in addition, a historical role, the realization of humanity's fall into barbarism. That this historical role is negative does not change the bureaucracy's class character one bit. History also experiences periods of collapse, and during these periods, society's class divisions continue to exist. The role of the ruling class during such a period can only be regressive. Economic, quote, progress, end quote, in Russia is progress only for the privileged class, and even as such, in the long run, it is incompatible with bureaucratic control over society. Finally, the bureaucracy's class character is not affected by the fact that this bureaucracy is not an organic product of capitalist society. Marx had already considered instances where the class struggle ends, quote, in the common ruin and defeat of the contending classes, end quote, and consequently with the appearance of a new ruling class. 29. In order to safeguard its position of predominance, there is no need at all for the bureaucracy to have recourse to the restoration of private capitalism. On the contrary, 
both from an economic viewpoint, complete elimination of economic crises, and from a political viewpoint, socialist camouflage for its totalitarian dictatorship, it is infinitely preferable for it to maintain the present system. The inheritance of privileges is fully guaranteed not by juridical rules, but by social laws governing the bureaucratic world. Just as the bourgeois, under, bourgeois, just as the bourgeois understood that the bourgeois in no way need to secure their possession of the state through juridical means, as feudal lords and absolute monarchs had done, in order to have effective control over it, so too did the bureaucrats know, and in this they are more Marxist than today's, quote, Trotskyist, end quote, that they in no way need to secure their ownership of the means of production through juridical means in order to actually possess the means of production. Capitalism in Russia could not be restored from within. It could only be restored as the result of armed foreign intervention. 30. The theory of the, quote, degenerated worker state, end quote, ought to be resolutely rejected. This theory is scientifically incorrect, for the theory of the degenerated worker state designates only the evolutionary process from which the present regime is descended while saying nothing about falsehoods about the regime's present character. The worker's state is characterized in essence not by the worker's state's economic basis, but rather by the actual political power of the working class. The Commune of 1871, the Russian Revolution, Russian Revolution up to 1921 to 23. That's actually, just as a, a side note for me, the very, it seems, maybe I'm wrong in this. I'm not an expert on the left opposition. But it seems like with, in the Trotskyist uh, framework, uh, 1923 is the big year of where the revolution really falls apart. Whereas uh, certain people, maybe more libertarian, would say uh, it ended in 1921 with the defeat of the Kronstadt uprising and the banning of factions within the parties and the outlawing of the workers' opposition within the party represented by Kolontai and Shlyapnikov. Um, other people would say, I think, uh, Maurice Brinton, as I've been reading, and kind of is why I'm reading Castoriadis now, as part of my own potential research for graduate school. Um, it would be the the disempowering of the factory committees much earlier in the course of the revolution. So it's interesting, I'm just saying here, that it's interesting that Castoriadis would even say as early as 1921, I mean, this is an early text of his, and he's still writing within Trotskyist organizations. This is for the Fourth International, I'm pretty sure. So to even suggest the year 1921 seems like, uh, you know, you know, if you uh, want to be, maybe it's a, uh, what's the word? Reading some kind of uh, teleology is like, oh, here he is. So he definitely goes this way. But uh, he definitely goes into a more libertarian direction in the future. Um, just because we know it happened in the future. But that doesn't necessarily mean anything. But still, just the 1921 thing is very interesting. I'm going to have to reread this sentence, though. Sorry for that aside. The worker state is characterized in essence not by its economic bases, but rather by the actual political power of the working class. The Commune of 1871, the Russian Revolution up to 1921 to 23, as soon as the real exercise of this power is undermined, the state becomes a degenerated worker state. Russia from 1921 to 23 to 1927. At the moment, when there no longer remains even a bit of power in the hands of the working class, the circle is closed and the, quote, degenerated worker state, end quote, is transformed into a state that no longer has a working class character. Moreover, this theory is politically disastrous, the theory of the degenerated uh, worker state, for it reinforces all the illusions and confusion that reign, reign among the masses concerning Soviet society. 31. Equally false is the conception of the Russian regime as a regime of, quote, state capitalism, end quote. This theory serves to conceal the inability of the theory's supporters to study a new phenomenon without having recourse to well-known 
formulas and usually rest upon deplorable confusion, as with George Muniz, who identifies any form of exploitation with capitalism. In fact, adherents to this theory are obliged to acknowledge that aside from the traits common to every exploitative society, Russian society exhibits none of capitalism's characteristics complete elimination of crises, lack of any objective determination of the rate of surplus value, lack of any law of wages, absence of any law of value, distribution of pop profit to the bureaucrats in accordance with their positions and not according to property titles. The quarrel would revert accordingly to a mere dispute over terminology if the falsity and the superficial character of the theory of state capitalism were not established by highly significant facts. Some of these facts are a. the instauration and stabilization of this regime, which normally ought to have been the product of an overdevelopment of capitalism, not in the advanced countries, the United States, Germany, England, but in a backward country. B. The absence of almost any connection between today's bureaucrats and former capitalists. C. The way in which the bureaucracy came to power. D. The Russian policy in the glasses. A policy of a sim... I don't know what that means, glasses, by the way. If someone knows, they can pop it in the comments. Unless you're a fucking douche who wants to just keep telling me how I pronounce words wrong as if I'm, like you're paying for this or I'm selling it to you or this isn't a totally amateur half-assed project to begin with that is explicitly acknowledges itself as such fucking dick <laughs> a policy of assimilation that in its first phase totally dispossessed the capitalists which would be absurd if the regime is to be set up where state excuse me a policy of assimilation that in its first phase totally dispossessed the capitalists, which would be absurd if the regime to be set up were state capitalism. Moreover, the, quote, logic, end quote, of their ideas pushes the adherents of this theory toward theoretically and politically stupid conclusions, like their correlation of Stalinist parties with fascist parties. Stalinist world policy. 32. Supported by the masses' illusions, the bureaucratic state and the Stalinist bureaucratic stratum in capitalist countries formed the social basis for the prospect of a possible fall into barbarism. The historical interests of this base are irreducibly opposed to those of the proletariat, and for 20 years the bureaucracy has consciously forced a series of defeats upon the revolutionary movement. The bureaucracy's interest, however, cannot be reconciled with those of imperialism either. The monopoly over foreign trade in the Russian zone and the political influence of Stalinism in capitalist countries are intolerable for the United States as our American economic penetration into its zones and the installation of rightist dictatorships in European countries intolerable for the bureaucracy. The common fear of revolution and of German and Japanese imperialism made compromises with during the war until now possible. If they succeed once again in crushing the revolution, imperialism and the bureaucracy will find themselves face to face on an inevitable collision course. 33. If the ultimate aim consciously pursued by the bureaucracy is world domination, its immediate aim is to prepare for war and to secure for itself the most favorable positions for this war. This strategy, as well as its class nature, imposes a particular tactic upon the bureaucracy. In the countries of the glasses, this tactic is expressed through the pursuit of structural assimilation according to the methods and rhythms necessitated by its fear of the masses and by its compromises with imperialism. In other European countries, the Stalinist parties pursue the bureaucratic conquest of the state and the reinforcement of their influence over the masses. Stalinism's Historical Chances 34. If today, in the face of imperialism on the one hand and the proletarian revolution on the other hand, Stalinism's chances appear minimal, this nevertheless changes neither the social character of Russia nor the historical significance of the phenomenon of bureaucracy. 
The degeneration of the revolution will always remain a possibility during every transitional period in history right up till the time communism is achieved. In the struggle against this possibility of degeneration, theoretical analyses certainly are indispensable, but the definitive, the, the, but the definitive solution will be given only by the revolutionary combat of the proletariat. The Fourth International indeed ought to become aware of the fact that it is struggling on the on the one hand against capitalism in capitalism's death throes, and on the other hand against nascent barbarism. Okay, uh, actually it says right here in the notes at the end of the essay, Galicis is a term borrowed from military terminology by Trotskyists and others to describe Russia's post-war, quote, buffer zone, end quote, Eastern Europe. That makes sense in context of what the rest of the text was saying. I thought it meant like Galicia, but that seemed too specific to what was uh, the topic of the essay. Or Galicia, however you pronounce it. Mm -hmm. Fuck you. <laughs>